Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. It is my honor to introduce tonight Jesse Reiser and Nanako Umemoto of the firm Ruhr. Um, Jesse Reiser uh, was a professor here many years ago. Um, they've done this beautiful book, um, Projects and Their Consequences, uh, which is a compendium of very significant projects and many of the stories uh, that come with the projects. Uh, I, I hope that we will see some of the projects in the book and their consequences, I explore some of the consequences together tonight. Uh, Jesse Reiser joined Princeton School of Architecture in 2000. He received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Cooper Union uh, in New York City and completed his Master of Architecture at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. He was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome in 1985, and he worked for the offices of John Heduck and Aldo Rossi prior to forming Reiser Umemoto Reiser with partner Nanako Umemoto. Nanako Umemoto uh, teaches at Washington University School of Architecture. She's a professor of practice there. Before teaching uh, in, in Washington University, she taught here at Columbia. Uh, Reiser Umemoto is a multidisciplinary firm operated at a wide range of scales, from furniture design to residential and commercial structure, structures up to the scale of landscape and infrastructure. The firm comprehensive monograph, Projects and Their Consequences, was published last year, 2019, and traces 30 years of innovative multidisciplinary investigations of form, structure, technique, and planning, and has some very nice anecdotes, too. Reiser Umemoto published before the Atlas of Novel Tectonics in 2006 um, and released the Japanese edition in 2008. They have recently, they have, they won two international competitions, the Taipei Pop Music Center and the Kashun Port, Air, uh, Ter Port Terminal, both scheduled to be completed in, in 2021. O14, a 22-story building um, that they built in Dubai, uh, has received numerous international honors, including the Concrete Industry Boards uh, Award and the Me of Merit and the American Council of Engineer Companies 2009 Diamond Award. Reiser Umemoto has been published widely and they have received many awards, including the Chrysler Award for Excellence in, Desi in Design in 1999, the John Heduck Award from the Cooper Union in 2011, and um, the USA Booth Fellowship from the United States Artists for Architecture and Design in 2012. I would like to read you one par two paragraphs of the, of the book that, uh, that I felt uh, cap encapsulated some of the issues that, that need to be discussed today and in this context. Concepts in isolation are fairly easy to formulate, and almost any intelligent person can create them. Form and composition, on the other hand, are monstrously hard. That is why they are revealed by so many. In fact, good ideas most often yield mediocre, sometimes bad, and, rarely, and, and very rarely good architecture. What separates ideas from architecture are a thousand small problems and a thousand small decisions. The difference between being on point or off, totally off, is infinitesimal small. Hence, the stories of Shana, Shana Goose Ingress tearing his hair out over the angle of a hand, or more directly pertinent to architecture, the image of me staring at the lines on a plan for hours and then adjusting them just a few millimeters. How is this not the image of the pastime of a madman? It is what separates the Seagram building from its mediocre lookalikes a few blocks away. This is also the difference that separ separates architectural ideology 
from impl implementation, the divide between the, a particular type promulgated for mass production and the specific por prototype that is it. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you tonight, Jesse Reiser. Thank you. Thank you, Galia, for the introduction. Um, in many ways, this is a homecoming for both Nanako and myself. We spent a good chunk of the 90s uh, teaching here and had the privilege of working both with an extraordinary group of colleagues and also students. And actually, Galia was in uh, our studio in, what, 95, I think. But just, um, it's just hard to, um, well, fathom, you know, the time has passed, but also um, to encapsulate in a lecture the scene at Columbia. The whole scene and what it did for multiple generations of architects, actually. Um, so I'm not going to do that tonight, um, and I'm not going to talk about uh, another family, which is the family business of RUR, which extends to my mother and um, my grandfather as well, uh, but rather to, I guess in a way, try to hint at uh, some of those concerns and those abiding interests um, through the work uh, that I'll be presenting. Um, so yeah, let me just jump in. This is um, a project which was over 10 years in the making, the uh, music center in Taipei. I think what characterizes uh, much of the work uh, in the office, and which actually started with Bernard's prompts at Columbia, um, was the uh, real desire to find um, a way of articulating not only architecture but urbanism in, from an architectural lens. I mean, in fact, Bernard, much to the consternation of the planning people, uh, basically instituted uh, a series of studios that you know, had the architects look at the city as opposed to you know, just the planning department. So I wasn't even aware of the frictions at the time. I was sort of the recipient and the kind of luck of being able to be involved in those projects. But there were all kinds of politics you know, running around Columbia, all kinds of projects um, and frictions, which actually made the place so exciting. The book, um, you know, trying to kind of wrestle with the content of almost 40 years of work uh, was daunting. We went through, I would say, like six or seven iterations, some of them more kind of professionally posed, others, uh, you know, trying other approaches. And uh, we were particularly um, inspired by um, Citizen Kane, believe it or not, because it allowed us not just to do a succession of projects, like a project's book, but to kind of weave back and forth between projects, the context around the projects, um, associated interests, in a much more nonlinear way. Uh, that and um, you know, this idea of a, 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 a cabinet of curiosities, that it would be a kind of collecting point for uh, the kind of seed germ of, of ideas. I mean, architects, I think, many times do this, you know, that um, either, you know, there are false starts in a project or there are little bits which um, get developed which might not go any further, but you kind of tuck them in your pocket uh, and save them for another project. So I think that's also characteristic of our design um, ethos and method um, that um, no project, in a sense, goes away. Um, uh, there kind of emerge a series of um, sustained projects um, in the office. And I have to say, most of these are retrospective. They're not pre-planned. But retrospectively, you see a certain consistency. That was part of the work of the book, was to kind of trace back uh, retrospectively to see consistencies. 
The first thing, actually, is the musical instrument problem, which was not a project, but it was an insoluble problem that was assigned by our dean at Cooper Union, John Hayduck, which took 35 years to at least figure out from our own perspective. But to give you an idea of what I mean about um, this kind of movement of a project, I, this is sort of a condensed version. Um, this is what happens, and, and I would say what a lot of very good architects do. Um, it's less about the argumentation per se, but they work very directly with the kind of geometrical material of projects. And um, in the case of, in this case, um, Cecil Balmond, uh, and, you know, as part of the Serpentine projects, was assigned, you know, over the years, various architects, uh, and he developed this really fascinating uh, kind of, uh, series of uh, geometrical structural experiments um, that he suggested to Toyo Ito he used for the serpentine plan, the series of kind of rotated, superimposed structural bents. Ito um, gets the material and basically um, and deliberately misreads the structural diagram, basically fills in all of the uh, spaces in between, makes it volumetric. Um, and that essentially kind of produces the formal uh, aspect of his serpentine. Nine years later, um, Su Fujimoto, who was Ito's assistant on the serpentine, um, revives the Bauman diagram again. This time applies it to the Taiwan Tower, ups the scale enormously, extrudes it on that kind of strange triangular site, and goes back to structure. So this, I would say, kind of encapsulates, you know, the way this kind of information moves from architect to architect, at least in this case. And I would say that, you know, that happens not only within a practice or across maybe from a master to a disciple, in the case of Ito, but it happens in the discipline as well. So um, the top two, well, the top uh, refers to, and I'll get into this a little later, um, the kind of overall trajectory of a, the project of the surface. Um, which is really kind of a transnational project. And then the RODNET project is something that stemmed from that uh, within our own practice. And I would say um, that the motivator, and especially um, in the 90s, and which has kind of persisted in our practice uh, up until today, for better or worse, is uh, the competition. So. This young cohort of um, uh, you know, teachers um, would hear myself, Nanako, Greg Lynn, uh, Hani Rashid, uh, who else, Bill and Shulan, Stan Allen. We would all enter the same competition, um, really knowing that we wouldn't win. But it was, uh, it was about competing with each other, outdoing one another. Um, and then there would, of course, be a post-mortem. And you know, before that, crank calls from Greg Glynn, or he would sketch my scheme, and whatever. But um, that really formed the kind of uh, energy, uh, at least among the young faculty at the school. And I remember you know, vividly being just blown away by the FOA uh, port terminal proposal. Um, you know, I think that's important, too, that you recognize the work of your contemporaries, how important that is. And, of course, we wanted to outdo that. So the, the next, you know, major competition that came up was the Kansai Library in Japan. Uh, I think it was among the last open competitions in Japan. And it was only much later that I began to make sense of the trajectory of... Um, that surface project. And it came about because Nanako and I were invited uh, to a roundtable discussion at uh, MoMA in response to the Japanese Constellation Show, um, which 
I guess because it's MoMA, there has you know, historically been an interest in national architectures, and people are particularly, you know, um, excited about, you know, master to disciple or followers and how work is transmitted. But it struck us that, um, you know, while this is accurate within a very circumscribed lens, it really didn't tell the story of how that work kind of came to Japan. So uh, we presented this diagram very quickly, you know. Um, it really starts, uh, you know, after all of the oblique architecture in Paron, it really starts full-blown with OMA. Um, and if you could say kind of merging the parking garage, which would be kind of an exemplary idea of bringing a street into a building, which would be part of Rem's model of a building as an urbanism, fuses those two things. And then as it kind of progresses both within his office, but also, uh, you know, the main designers who kind of follow in that office, uh, let me actually go back, but basically develop uh, into a more topological architecture till finally we get the FOA uh, scheme that Alejandro and Farshid did at the Architectural Association. Now there was a really interesting kind of moment uh, there where Cecil Balmond was their uh, uh, structural advisor um, and of course they wanted to produce a topological architecture that would be kind of surface-based, as thin as possible. He recommended kind of exploring it through a concept by Robert Le Ricolet um, called the Isoflex system. The problem was that um, given the spans and that really just the shallowness of the spans, there was no way that that model would work. I mean, if it got more shape, you could probably make spans, but Given the gentleness of those spans, uh, there was no way to use the Isoflex kind of thin model. Um, ultimately, uh, when the project uh, went into building, which was something like four years later, uh, they had a parting of the ways with Balmond, and they worked with a very fine kind of older engineer, Kunio Watanabe. Watanabe. Uh, basically had them fuse a, um, an origami sort of folded plate system to the smooth surface, and that was what was built. Mitsuro Sasaki, who was actually the engineer for all of those Sana projects and Toyoito, saw Watanabe's project. He thought it was too fat, it's like not elegant, not representing the surface model, so he went about um, you know, refining that. We, meanwhile, um, made a proposition for the Kansai Library, ran into the same problem. I came up to Israel Sinek with a wax model, which was already drooping, and Sinek said, well, it's, it's drooping here, it's going to droop in the building. He also, uh, being of the same generation of um, our, uh, engineers as um, Watanabe suggested a folded plate, but instead of a folded plate attached to each floor, superstructure it and then hang the delicate slabs under it. So that actually initiated a whole series of projects, which we call the rod net projects. We kind of worked our way out of the surface project, but that logic um, continued for like 15 years in various kind of programs and sites. And then um, Sasaki continued to refine the structural surface, basically nailed it, uh, I would say. Kind of, he was not the kind of originator, but he did the final refinement and actually achieved that kind of desired state. I mean, personally, I think that's part of the problem, too, that in a way, um, the structural surface is less interesting than the FOA scheme with the, uh, with the origami attached to the folded plate. So the difference between an architectural uh, ambition, I guess, and then a purely kind of technical uh, you know, structural one. 
So yeah, I mean, I present this to our thesis students, basically to dis, you know, say that this becomes a kind of working model, this rod net. We kind of turned it inside out, tried all kinds of transformations, and would apply a model to a particular site and a particular program. So in other words, it isn't simply a matter of problem solving, I don't know, around a particular site and program from nothing, but these kinds of models become the vehicle through which you read the site and the particularities of program. And um, yeah, I mean, the other thing is that those net projects really um, dealt with very different programs, very different sites, and very different places. So Galia asked me about, I don't know, discussion about disciplinarity and, and, uh, and the profession. And there was a wonderful, very clear argument that Andy Zago put together about the discipline of architecture as opposed to the profession. Um, and so I'll just let you read it. But essentially, um, I think it's a very kind of clear articulation of where we do uh, ultimately have uh, political traction as architects uh, you know, in the field, the importance of the field itself, and uh, you know, along with it, its whole you know kind of history and kind of formal dimension, uh, not to be jettisoned. <clears throat> Too fast? Oh, should I go back? Sorry. So it's a capacity unique to the discipline not to be you know, quickly jettisoned. So Andy goes on to describe you know, the scale of the discipline as opposed to the profession and you know, what comes out of it. So you know, the Seattle Public Library as a kind of disciplinary you know, project as well as a you know, wonderful library and then what, how the profession would see a library. And then he did an interesting kind of take on research, uh, how kind of professional research is done and how it's argued. Uh, he, there was an interesting kind of piece by Studio Gang about birds being killed by collision with windows. And this is you know, Jeannie's diagram of that. And then she uses it, um, she basically uses the rod net idea uh, as an early adapter, I would say, but then argues for it, uh, you know, as a kind of as a way of uh, you know preventing bird strikes. So Andy, God bless him, um, did his own research and found out that you know far more birds are killed by house cats, uh, and so yeah, his Andy's cartoon. Anyway, um, this leads to the kind of the substance of the talk, uh, which was inspired by this wonderful quote by Jean-Luc Godard. And, you know, kind of following on that, that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work in and around architecture, um, but I, I guess I'm still wrestling with it. But I think uh, much of what we see in the schools and in, you know, especially in the ac academe, um, are projects that I would argue deal more with, um, I don't know, architecture is a finished off category that you could kind of um, advance arguments politically through other media as well. Architecture becomes just another subject matter. So I'm gonna show uh, three uh, big projects and four small ones. First, um, a project that kind of hovers between architecture and another discipline, our proposal, uh, our kind of work on the Boris Godunov production at Princeton uh, in 2006. 
It was uh, never, uh, uh, it was the world premiere because it was stopped in 1936. It was a collaboration between you know, Prokofiev and, and, um, and Meyerhold, the director, uh, which was suddenly ended because of um, Stalinist repression. But Meyerhold's, um, the thrust of much of Meyerhold's work, and I don't want to simplify it, but um, that it goes very much against a kind of naturalistic theater, even, you know, the work of Stanislavski, there's a tremendous interest in, uh, you know, how the body kind of works in space as part of the drama. It's non-objective, it's not representational in the normal sense. Um, one of the examples, which he did with Luba Popova, who did the set uh, for the magnanimous cuckold, um, is this machinic set um, that you know is heavily interacted by uh, the actors, and it becomes a kind of index apparently when the, the gears are moving of rising and kind of settling tensions in, in the play. And, but in other words, it's not um, it's it's the experiment of an architect, I would say, in scenic design as opposed to a set designer, and you know very much in keeping with that. We um, looked for a way of creating a set which, which was very nearly an instrument for the actors to work with, with their bodies, which would also almost produce the kind of ether of the space itself to kind of make visible that ether. So we worked with um, about three quarters of a mile of rubber tubing that kind of worked in tracks. It would produce uh, you know, various kinds of sets, but this is like one of the battle scenes uh, that the forces of kind of pulling, you would actually see uh, the movement through this kind of skein of um, uh, rubber tubes. And it could also become represent representational or acquire the shape uh, of a specific architecture through these other tools uh, as the actors worked with them. So the idea of producing, you know, a kind of instrument for performance, you know, was really kind of important in this design. And uh, uh, as many of you uh, probably know, Meyerhold did not meet a happy end. Um, he was kind of persecuted and prosecuted and executed um, for being a formalist. And this is one of his, his quotes. And it, you know, extended, you know, to the whole intelligentsia who were uh, kind of accused of that. I, the reason why I say that is, and present this material, I mean, in addition to um, my interest in Meyerhold, is what I perceive, and I mean, I see this at Princeton, almost every lecturer uh, has to open their lecture with a kind of renunciation of form, which I think is just insane. Um, everything has a form, and so to me it's simply a limited kind of repertoire of you know, formal use. But you can see you know, what happened uh, from the Melnikov house, which still exists, and the Mel Melnikov family still in there, but this was the kind of the triumphant um, socialist realism. And it still continues you know, in reactions to Maya Lin's memorial the accusation of nihilism, and then the kind of necessity of producing, you know, a realistic representation next to it. And, you know, kind of equally from the right and the left, or the right and the right, however you would want to understand these two people. And, you know, extends to criticism of our work as well. So, um, I'm going to kind of joke, jump back a bit to our 014 tower in Dubai. It was um, commissioned, uh, this is the kind of central area of what they call Business Bay, um, which was, like the name says, a business area in Dubai. Um, and it was commissioned after a competition that we entered with very well-known architect, Zaha Hadid, actually won the competition, which would have been built in that circular island in the front, never was built, 
but the young developer who ran the competition for Dubai properties went off on his own, was interested in our project you know, for the large tower that we didn't win, uh, and commissioned, uh, it was his first kind of independent project as a developer and our first major you know, project. So it's a 22-story office uh, tower with an exoskeletal shell. Um, he, we engaged a lot of different people from all over the world to kind of, Dubai really didn't have so much in a way uh, of its own uh, kind of internal industry. It was really about bringing people from all over. Uh, in particular, the executive architect, uh, Christian Lebanese, our engineer was also our structural, uh, and well, he was our teacher at Cooper Union, Israel Sinek, who was a very right-wing uh, kind of uh, anti-Castro Cuban. Um, the contractors were two Palestinian brothers with a very small contracting company, um, and the developer, Shahab Lutfi. The situation was really, uh, I don't know, just strange bedfellows, but we all worked you know, quite well. Uh, it, they couldn't pronounce Israel Sinek because they couldn't pronounce Israel at the, you know, so they called it Yas. Anyway, it was, a, you know, it was a really kind of interesting, very intense, very small group um, that got the project done. So this is a kind of night view of the shell. Um, here you kind of get an idea as a, you know, kind of um, an outer shell form um, between 60 and uh, 40 centimeters thick, and then a one meter air gap uh, before getting to the actual enclosure of the, uh, of the building, uh, which is window wall. Um, and then parking down below, and then an elevated kind of podium. One of the things we had to confront, and in a way you could call it a critical approach uh, to this situation, is that um, typically in Dubai, and this is a kind of view of Sheikh Zayed Road, um, they will build the tower and then there will be a parking structure immediately behind. That's a kind of really typical, and so the kind of a dead street behind that kind of lineup of towers. Halcro, which is a big English uh, kind of planning company, master planned um, Business Bay and in a very, I don't know, POMO uh, way with you know, large covered arcades at the base and buildings that they expected to have a middle and a top. And you were supposed to kind of screen the parking structure. We were able to uh, convince the developer that since our project um, was on a prominent site on the water that it would be better to bury the parking um, and then to elevate this kind of podium structure, make it occupiable office. So uh, it was about, uh, you know, a whole process of actually presenting this project, arguing for the arcade-like uh, development at the base, that it would do those things. We super elevated this podium because it was uh, a building right in front of the waterfront, so we saw it as a you know, way of kind of gateway to the waterfront esplanade. And then there was actually a very interesting proposal by OMA uh, who uh, finally lost the plan uh, for Business Bay, went to Halcro about uh, continuous gardens on the second level. So that's actually part of our project, although it's sort of utopian because the neighboring buildings don't do that. But kind of tipping the hat to OMA for doing the right thing, we incorporated that. And so this is that kind of elevated uh, space and bridges then connect these kind of U-shaped bar building uh, to the tower, uh, going to pass through that gap. And this is what happens down at the base now. I got this from a, about a year ago. There's a wind that the building induces uh, through the stack effect, and so they work out under here. Uh, so aside from the kind of idea of this being a gateway, 
it actually functions, uh, you know, as part of this um, exercise club that's, you know, located at the base. But, uh, you know, working through the problem um, with Sinek, very interesting. I won't go into too much detail about it, but essentially, um, with the dire grid, uh, you have enormous redundancy, meaning that um, you know you can remove quite a bit of the material, and the forces will find a way of working. So uh, we were able to kind of you know modulate the openings, have uh, them drift, and then constant back and forth work with the engineer to find the kind of paths down to a, actually a gridded column structure, you know, below ground. So it was a kind of trickle down of forces, you know, through this. Those dashes you see are the connections uh, to the floor slabs. And this is that gap space looking up. So it, you know, produces, a, you know, a, a rather strong stack effect actually and it was never measured precisely, but they estimated about a 30% uh, reduction in cooling costs for the building. It just won a 10-year award, actually, from the Council on Tall Buildings, so. And so this leads me to, um, uh, an argument about sustainability. Um, I guess I would want to say, first of all, not to be misunderstood that it is very important, but I think it's a minimal expectation for architects today to make a sustainable building, um, but it's not enough. And uh, these, you know, both buildings have one uh, kind of lead platinum ratings, uh, which means they meet performance criteria but the architecture couldn't be any more different, uh, which leads me you know, to the conclusion that luckily, um, there isn't a kind of codified sustainable architecture. It's about meeting uh, you know, certain goals in terms of you know, material performance, however you know, that is done. And I think that's always going to be, I mean, especially now in tension with kind of disciplinary questions about architecture. I mean, if a neoclassical building and a Tom Main building, uh, you know, are both kind of meeting the numbers, then obviously architecture, you know, is in a kind of very peculiar position relative to this issue of sustainability, meaning, I mean, somewhat independent. Um, because in a way, you know, you're contributing to something that's a statistical condition, to something that's enormous and invisible, um, unless you want to make it visible, which means it then becomes a representational question. Almost the inverse, I think, of the black square by Malevich. I guess non-objective would apply to both, uh, but other than that, and by extension architecture, um, these are kind of working on a very different plane. Now, of course, you know, there are buildings that will, you know, actively want to represent the ethos of the sustainable. Um, but then I think one has to be, you know, very clear about um, that dimension. It's kind of a symbolization of sustainability as opposed to whether or not, uh, you know, it actually performs its uh, sustainable uh, function. Anyway, to kind of move on, um, there was a lot of work on the geometry of the, of the void forms in the project. Uh, you know, each, depending upon where they hit the geometry of the building in kind of purely convex or purely concave and in these kind of mixed zones where the geometries change. We went through uh, an enormous learning curve in the actual construction. Um, all of the scripts at the time that were done um, were rejected. Uh, this is for the automation of the production of all the forms. They were rejected by the Chinese contracting company because they couldn't legally take responsibility for them. Now, it represents a certain moment, I think, in the history of construction. The other thing that we learned, which somehow was not factored into the purely geometrical question, 
um, was that the form work, especially at the bottom of each pore, uh, was being crushed, slightly deformed by the kind of pressure of the concrete. So um, the quick fix actually was um, wrapping each one of these kind of foam forms with melamine strapping to harden them enough to hold together. But the lower floors of 014 are kind of funny because they had to be hand ground back. So uh, some of them are more like arches, some of them more like squircles, and then it finally, you know, got regularized as, you know, we learned more. This is you know, one of the kind of office spaces. We didn't design the furniture or the interior, but the, you know, the views out And then kind of a view of the, uh, the roof where the shell kind of emerges, uh, you know, free of the, of the floor slabs. Okay, then uh, quite a few years later, we explored a kind of um, derivative project, you know, from 014, but looking at um, kind of fully kind of three-dimensional development of space. This was for... Um, the uh, Hong Kong Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. We were given the typology of the building uh, and the use, and uh, we developed a scheme that would essentially address uh, the inequities of you know, the different kind of groups that live in Hong Kong to make a mixed uh, you know, a tower where, uh, you know, Wealthy people, middle class, and you know, poor and transient people would live together. And so these kind of bubble-like spaces become you know, common spaces uh, for the building. There are a series of ramp, localized ramps that lead uh, the residents to these common spaces. And then this is a kind of illustration of one of those uh, zones. So the office is kind of simultaneously involved in these kinds of projects, which I kind of advisedly call uh, research, um, but also you know, in, in the you know, construction projects as well. And so I'm going to show um, a couple of what we are kind of calling uh, chamber projects. Again, uh, more along the line of um, experimentation and research. The first being the Flux Room, which was part of a show uh, that Zaha Hadid curated uh, called Latent Utopias back in 2002. Um, and so we were interested in really literalizing. There was a lot of discussion about flow and uh, kind of the, the connection between material um, behaviors and flow patterns. We wanted to literally kind of explore it uh, through the vehicle of, of, of magnetism. So um, we worked with the Advanced Geometry Unit at Arup in London uh, with a, a a scientist who is an uh, expert, uh, you know, in magnetic uh, design and waves, um, and created a chamber completely covered with solenoids that were all hand wound. Had to construct um, <laughs> five thousand needles on gimbals, magnetic needles that would then respond to magnetic flux. This was the, the kind of sketch. It was really interesting The we worked this out at the Otis Elevator factory in Yonkers, and we couldn't figure out why we were getting these strange artifacts in the, in the needles, and it turned out the rebars in the floor were also influencing the magnetic field and created different alignments than the script. 
Anyway, it was a you know, very intense project. Zaha had actually bailed us out because we were in the whole $60,000, I think, which she did. Um, and um, it took a lot of kind of off-the-cuff experimentation. Um, there was a real uh, problem in getting the control systems that would be you know, off the shelf. And then I realized that toy train control systems and their chips maybe would work because they basically deal with acceleration, deceleration, all of the things that uh, we needed these to do. And in fact, they did. So we were able to kind of take care of that problem. But it was, you know, a major uh, kind of undertaking, wiring this thing, and then working on uh, kind of routines and scripts to get this thing to move. It was very strange, too, because um, we were looking aesthetically at these kind of smooth flows, like the School of Fish that Jeff Kipnis was talking about. What actually happened, um, because this is what the kind of scientists call a contaminated scale, um, friction, uh, inertia, all of the things that kind of uh, uh, happen at this scale in magnetism as opposed to the very small, which is what they normally experiment in, or something the size of CERN, um, don't uh, involve this. So the scientists were really excited that they were able to see a statistical sampling <laughs> of magnetic needles and how they worked. Second is a project um, that we're, we just completed, actually, today. Uh, it's part of a show that uh, is based on the work of Daniel Lopez on Bucky Fuller. Uh, he did a series of projects at many schools, actually, um, including Princeton, uh, called the Geoscope, which was a kind of a geodesic dome that then had map of the world applied to it, and you were to go inside of that dome and thereby kind of understand your relationship to the to the globe in a different way, and I guess to the cosmos. Um, and yeah, just some examples of that. This is the Pattern Thinking book, which is really a marvelous book. I mean, it's an enormous kind of repository of uh, work in the archive um, at Princeton and other schools uh, of these experiments. And we were asked to design this show. so. Um, kind of independently came up with the idea of producing a, um, an inflatable that you would enter. Uh, I was you know, also looking at biology, this kind of blastula form in embryology, kind of an open hollow ball of cells uh, that could be um, you know, rethought of as a, uh, an inflatable. And this is the logo that we created, the mission patch. And then this is what uh, the kind of rendering of the design. So we have uh, 42 projectors projecting into this inflatable uh, kind of inwardly. And you actually go into this hatch and then would be basically have the show presented to you. And so Daniel Lopez is working on, you know, the. Um, curating all of that material. It reminded us of the kind of Los Alamos gadget, which was the first atomic bomb. And then this is the inflatable in its first tests. We also had to make a cradle. This all happened um, within one month. We designed it in about four days. And then the cradle will then carry um, lighting and then this gel-like uh, material for people to lie in. And yeah, this is kind of the earlier state where <clears throat> they're still working on the electronics down below with the inflatable above, the completed sphere. And then this was uh, today, actually. Uh, the first sort of kind of show is being presented. So I encourage everyone to come out maybe on the 13th if you're interested There'll be a roundtable discussion, and you'll be able to you know, experience the uh, geoscope, too.
It was also a really interesting collaboration done in mainly on Skype, and I just kind of give this quote from Stan Allen uh, that it was a great interdisciplinary project because everybody stayed in their own discipline. Okay, now to uh, the larger projects, the Taipei Music Center. This was a project that was 10 years um, in formation before it was given out um, in competition. So it was really part of a concerted effort um, by the Taiwan government to acknowledge their music industry, which was one of the first in East Asia, but was not really kind of, didn't have a kind of visual presence or a place that would, they would belong to. They were kind of scattered producers in Taipei and various other places, and the ambition was to bring all of those people together um, in this piece of urbanism, really, um, where um, s bands would be you know, created and rolled out and have performances. So, I don't know, you too would not be at this place, they would go to a stadium, but this was in a way for a smaller scaled uh, you know, set of you know, both production and performance uh, venues and clubs and that cube that you see over there is a small museum and archive. So um, it was you know, led out in competition. The two very difficult sites uh, actually formed that. Most of the competitors um, chose to consolidate the entire project in one site, in a way following an OMA model, I would say, where you would have an urbanism in a building. And we were the only ones who actually spread the project out over both sites, uh, which initially posed problems because of the kind of acoustical codes in Taipei. Uh, but luckily, we were able to get around that. But the ambition was really, uh, you know, to, as in many competitions, um, that the building be uh, iconic, it be visible, it would be, you know, projected on many different kinds of platforms and media. Even if you didn't ever go to this place, it would be immediately kind of given the identity of the music center. But we were also very interested in, you know, what happens during the downtime. And I think that was one of the things we argued for, that uh, consolidating the project into one building, either it's open or it's closed. Um, and we argued for, uh, you know, a design that would be, you know, used by the you know, local people is an everyday you know, site, and then it would go over to performance mode, you know, mainly at night. We went through many design iterations. The project, the winning project in the competition was not the one that was built, um, but this, I'll kind of just show it briefly, um, involved, you know, connecting the two sites, the long site and then the consolidated site uh, with a bridge. Um, this cubic building, which is also you know, still a museum, would actually have um, seats in it. And then there was a moving uh, stage. Uh, and so typologically, we moved from a stadium as single focus to a circus, a very, of course, Roman idea. Opened the circus up at both ends and then kind of grew a, a branch to connect to, uh, to the other side. And the idea was that um, it would be, a, you know, the, the, the site would be flexible. In other words, there would be an open park, the stage, uh, you know, in a major uh, outdoor performance would be kind of held way back. Uh, and then as um, this robot stage moved towards the cube, uh, you could handle, uh, you know, a medium-sized crowd and then have open public park in its wake. And then finally, for you know, very intimate performances, the uh, robot stage, which would fold while it was moving, would actually kiss the cube, and there would be you know, in very close proximity for you know, much smaller, intimate kinds of performances. This is some of our study models, mainly for the Taipei Pop. So you see this geode-like image in the center 
that's the seating uh, on the face of the cube, and this was the rendering of how it would look if you were sitting in that seating. And yeah, view kind of looking down in a you know kind of small scale performance. So um, about a year into the project, um, it moved from being a public, uh, governmentally run project to the music industry. And basically, we had to start over. Um, they actually increased the scale of the main hall from 3,000 seats to 5,000. And we uh, really began in earnest to work very closely with you know, many different stakeholders. So uh, the mayor, uh, the woman to the right of him is a kind of well-known songwriter. The uh, promoter of May Day is a man on the glasses, in the glasses, and then the local architects, who was actually, um, I think Michael Fay might have been in your class at Columbia. So he was part of that, that firm. That was very important. But anyway, enormous sort of redesign took place. We went back in the continuum from circus uh, you know, to the elevated stage and went back to a, the circus idea. And then here, and I guess this probably connects more back to my Rossi experience, um, the, you know, kind of interesting transformation from a circus to a plaza, which took 1,200 years in Rome, we basically had to do this every day. In other words, it would be performance and then go back to public space. And so this is uh, kind of a rough construction shot, uh, probably about a year ago, uh, you know, of the creation of that kind of open uh, circus space uh, and this uh, the fabric around it, which is uh, um, restaurants and shops. And then a more recent picture now uh, from within the plaza looking towards this Hall of Fame building. And then this, the seating, which also kind of leads you across the street to the main hall, but it also is used for spectatorship. And then some renderings we made of the kind of two different modalities. One, the, the outdoor performance space on the left, and then uh, you know, shopping and you know, its use as a plaza. So those are the kind of the primary elements of the project the main hall for 5,000, um, these large live houses and clubs, the outdoor performance uh, space, and then the Hall of Fame and Museum. And we worked very carefully with these sort of liminal conditions with the staircase in the cube. When it changed from being a geode, it became the primary circulation um, for the museum. And so there was also kind of a history of uh, music in the staircase as part of the exhibitions. But I think it was, you know, um, important, you know, that we kind of extend the project to the whole site, that it became, uh, in other words, a kind of a new neighborhood. And this is a, uh, where we were coming from relative to this project. It was an old industrial site, so we worked with a built ground, which in a way resonated with the natural terrain around it, and then these object buildings kind of sit on the constructed ground uh, of the plaza and also under the theater. And then, you know, this bridge which cuts across, which creates actually an elevated entry to the theater. So we were really interested in this uh, kind of new horizon Taipei incidentally uses that as a um, kind of datum, all of these, there are a whole system of um, elevated pedestrian bridges. So this project in a certain way orients itself sectionally to that elevated approach. And we're also very interested in the kind of silhouette of the buildings, uh, you know, especially because the buildings will be kind of visible uh, in twilight and at night. Uh, and so the character of those silhouettes were of particular interest. And also working with a kind of groundwork in a way, 
uh, for the fabric, so looking at even stupas and these sort of ground-based elements, and then the shadow, the silhouette of uh, you know, these large imposing roofs that would be seen at any point in the project. So the, the, this bermed up uh, structure hides all of the service to the back of the theater, all the trucks kind of deliver to that level in, in the berm, and then the public spaces sort of flow over that. And then there's again, I'm gonna elevate, there are two levels of entry uh, into the lobby, one from the bridge across the street, and then the lower level lobby, which is um, more for, uh, well, people coming off the street proper, but also for red carpet events. But I sort of show this in comparison because they're basically very similar projects in terms of the scale and even the typology of the theater, these big fan shapes. Um, and so we were trying to defeat the verticality that you normally have in a theater like that because of this uh, you know, pedestrian bridge and this new horizon we were creating. Uh, whereas Bernard's, you know, you can really see how high this theater, you know, gets. We were also particularly interested in the materiality of the site, not to represent, I don't know, old standing seam or corrugation, which you see, but to try to push those technologies as much as we can. These are, this is actually the steel decking under the corrugated. Uh, and we were also interested in, in you know, peculiar finish. Um, this is a, it's called alumite, and it's an old form of anodizing, particularly in Japan, you mainly see it in Japan, they use it on aircraft too, and it had a very interesting, the theory was that it would blend with sea and sky in a different way than an aluminum aircraft. So we were looking at that, and then also at, I don't know, not cheap corrugated construction, but this is the, actually a detail of a Junkers um, 52 transport, and it's kind of a detailing tour de force of how to kind of connect uh, corrugated material together. So, kind of drawing from those technologies, uh, you know, and those, that way of detailing was, you know, particular interest to us. So there was a lot of discussion back and forth on the rolling of these sections and how to achieve these geometries. This is a view from the lower level in the theater. And I go on the upper level bridge entry. So it goes right, the bridge is basically coextensive with all of the salons and all of the waiting spaces. It's more bridge wrapping the core of the theater. And this was one of the, the um, early openings where they were testing sound and you know, invited a group of uh, you know, people in to hear the, the bands. So this should be opening officially uh, this summer. This is kind of a view from that entry bridge and then the arcades, which are really necessary and then a view into the plaza as you're walking from the street. And you get a sense of the scale and also the kind of looming roof you know, of the main hall, all of the elements being visible you know, from that. This is the industry shell and it also serves as a kind of overhang for outdoor performance. And then a view back at that stair. So really, yeah, I mean, it kind of created this new kind of ground at the upper level. And you can see Nanako standing on the kind of roof. We're trying to get this to be a public space. It isn't yet. Um, we probably have to put railings up, unfortunately. Okay. So this is the final project I'll be kind of discussing tonight, the Kaohsiung Port Terminal, which will open next winter. Um, again, it was part of, um, you know, a, a major international competition. Um, Kaohsiung wanted uh, 
not to create a post-industrial situation, but actually superimpose um, public space and building and this new, the Port of Authority Tower and a new kind of cruise ship terminal and ferry terminal along the edge. So it was both a planning project and an architectural project. But I want to go back to the last of the sort of problems, which was something that John Haydock posed to the thesis students at Cooper Union in 1981. Um, John, um, you know, took this as a kind of warm-up exercise, but he had hoped uh, that it would actually, the, the, the analysis they did, and they did exquisite drawings of musical instruments, which you see in the book, uh, this oboe just blew me away. Um, Stan Allen did this, and he did a triangle. So his irony was there even, you know. But I was completely entranced by the biomechanical stuff, and I was right, right into it. Anyway, so of course the first sort of response at the Venice Biennale, which was an open one that Rossi did, was to try to do some, a drawing as beautiful as the musical instrument. So it was an anamorphic projection of, of, uh, of the guts of a clock. Um, and I guess there's some little element of modernist in me. It didn't work. It was, you know, worked for Dali as an image, but it was not something that, you know, I was totally happy with. It was a really difficult problem. By the way, I mean, the students, the thesis students, couldn't, couldn't ever really integrate the musical instruments into their final thesis work. The best they could do was, you know, kind of very precise drawings of roof ventilators. I don't know, but it was like a very hard nut to crack. And John himself, I would say, didn't even know what he wanted. That was part of the reason. So, flash forward 40 years later, we get this MEP drawing back um, from the engineers, and it's like, yeah, they did it. We didn't draw it, but they basically did the musical instrument, which in retrospect made a lot of sense. I mean, it was a kind of branching system. It was duct work. It had to navigate a complex form. She got, you know, got kind of captured it anyway. So that kind of leads me into, you know, the, the port terminal. Um, it is part of a much wider system of uh, cruise ship uh, lines that actually does connect to the Yokohama port terminal as well. Neil Denari did an amazing proposal, which unfortunately didn't get built for the Keelung Harbor. You should look at that. Um, and then this is what we confronted on the site. Um, it was, you know, massively polluted. When you kind of cut into the ground, there was literally a lake of oil under the site. So that delayed the project for something like five years. They were sucking oil out. And Monica Ponce de Leon wanted us to do presentations on post-industrial. So I started to look into this site more carefully. And we found out that Mitsubishi um, built large tanks here because this was the base of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Uh, it was a major base for capital ships. And of course, it was a target for the US Navy. So I was able to find our T4 is our site. So it was bombed. And there, I mean, everything is, you know, is there for the looking. But it was just extraordinary to see the kind of material you know, history um, and the politics of the site uh, you know, over time. So the challenge was to superimpose uh, keep, well, keep the industrial waterfront working at grade, um, create a new public level, elevated public level, uh, kind of extend that in our plan along the entire edge, and then in a sense to insert the terminal in between. So this sort of codes those levels in the project as built, um, all of the baggage handling and all of the kind of mechanisms for that happen at the service level. There's an intermediate level, which is the terminal kind of surface proper, and then the blue is public uh, boardwalk. 
And then we kind of generated a master plan along with the competition for that. And the ambition really was to have it extend all the way uh, along the edge. But of course, we had a de very defined architectural problem and you know, defined the project that way. But all of those elements are still there. Um, so this is a view from the water, a view from the land side. The concept was really to make kind of three big tubes of space that would fuse together, be visible from one kind of entry point, be, you know, super clear, and that um, we'd be able to kind of connect at a higher level. Um, the unticketed public could be able to use um, restaurants and shops at you know, the upper level, which is uh, you know, the boardwalk. So it really works like an airport. Um, I'm going to uh, go straight out from an elevated drop-off. Our initial proposal was more romantic, uh, like New York, where you would enter the ships from the surface of the pier, but that got eliminated when we worked with the Arab logistical people on how cruise ships you know, actually work. Uh, and so it's really a kind of bundle of um, public space, infrastructure, and then this kind of tubular building. Uh, we worked very hard to create thick walls that would house all of the vertical circulation in the poche as well as places of refuge for fire to keep the kind of spaces, you know, the main public spaces clear. Also, you know, introducing other kinds of programs uh, you know, for the vitality of this space, uh, you know, when ships are not in port. So this is a quick animation of the project. Kind of view from the landward side, the drop off, you know, into the kind of lobby space, and then basically the views down each one of those, you know, large, you know, tubes of space that lead out you know, to the ships. And there's one of those restaurants you know, looking down at the main space, which gives access both to people in the boardwalk and if you have time up in, you know, from the terminal. So this is a, you know, the project as it stands now. Again, next, a lot of work being done on the facade and the interior fit out. The diagrid structure um, didn't change. This project really didn't change essentially from competition to completion because we were working with it, uh, engineers instead of uh, the cultural people. And then this, this was done actually for Farshid Musavi. She wanted an analysis for um, a show in London of the structure, circulation, and cladding of the buildings. This is one of the kind of well-like planters of, kind of large trees and shrubs will be planted in this. And then the kind of overhanging um, cantilevering lobes so this gives you kind of a sense of the, you know, the section of the building, um, the elevated restaurants, and then the kind of, in the lower level, the um, connection to the boardwalk, as well as the kind of overall spaces. Uh, one, yeah, other comment, which relates to form. Um, we had a trilobe model for the initial phase of the uh, Taiwei, uh, Taipei Music Center uh, and then modified it, basically kind of changed it. So I'm going to go into a little bit of a detour just about you know, the politics of imagery, uh, starting with the, the Guernica. The influence, you know, both of um, Jericho and Rapt of Medusa, that kind of composition, but also his own, you know, very strong um, 
formal and organizational language, his figural language, in a way, pre, well, it does pre-exist the content. It's still a powerful thing. And so when Colin Powell presented uh, at the UN in front of the tapestry, they pulled um, curtains over the Guernica. He was you know, arguing for the Gulf War. And then this sort of transformation as well, which is right next to our office, um, using the Guernica composition, but then uh, dealing with the local kind of scene and politics in East Harlem. So you know, the bull becomes a pit bull. And you know, various other kind of elements uh, you know, are transformed to you know, more kind of local concerns. And it's continuing to change. So the graffiti on this painting is in a way a territorial mark on top, superimposed on that painting. Anyway, I'm gonna get yeah, back to this. We're almost done. Um, we were looking uh, you know, at this trilobe model for many years since the Cardiff Bay Opera House. And I realized we could basically just turn the arrows from theater, which focuses in on a stage, to entry, which focuses out, and still use the morphology, which is what we did. So this is sort of a, a lineage of projects uh, on the trilobe that we've been kind of pursuing for years. And you can see also the way in which uh, you know, that organization can be kind of shifted from you know, the Melnikov model to Cardiff. Originally, it was more an acoustical argument, too, about fusing shoebox halls together. And then I'll close with this construction, accelerated construction. Thank you. Thank you so much sure. for, for sharing your work. It, it's so beautiful. I mean, we could talk about uh, the work itself, or just the work, or uh, the importance of the work. Uh, one of the images that stays in my mind is uh, the images of your table with all the different models uh, that evolve through time. Um, but I'm going to choose to talk about something that I think we many more of us share, and that um, and and it's this um, diagram uh, of the profession and the discipline mm -hmm. and the proportion of one and the other, and your assertion um, that the time at Columbia, uh, the the mid '90s, uh, with Bernard, it's, it's like. Uh, Shumi put all of you together. Um, you had you have been creating this family for a long time. You know, from Japan to Cooper Union, you have been working on this network of people and accumulating people um, that conveying that came here from you know Stan Allen, Whether Stan brought you here or Bernard, and then. Mm -hmm. Greg Lynn came through Princeton and Stan and all these mm -hmm. group of people are here. Um, Bernard is giving certain direction as to where the school is going. Right. You are contributing your own investigations. The Yokohama competition comes along. And I remember as a student how all of us mm -hmm. saw the, the different projects that were emerging. And then what you said in the lecture that I think it's very important also to see is that when Alejandro Sairapolo and Farshid uh, competition, uh, entry competition was uh, published, everyone acknowledged how mm -hmm. important that was. Right. And that's the kind of the energy of the discipline that mm -hmm. you, know, you see a group of people pioneering different directions, keeping in dialogue, then one project emerges and then within a few years, every office, you know, Morphosis, mm -hmm. Saha, are using those tools. Right. And uh, some of those tools may have originated in OMA. They go back mm -hmm. through students. Right. And so the, the discipline somehow has a loop that is a very curious loop. Yes. Um, and so my question to you, or my response to your question is like, you share that 
an Andrusago diagram. Yes. But you know a lot about drawings and flows and diagram. Isn't it much more complicated than a big circle with a kind of a smaller circle? Isn't of like course it is. Yeah. So how, yes. how would you illuminate a bit of how, oh, that, no. that <laughs> how does that work? In your own work that you go from teaching to doing this really large project and skipping kind of the middle ground of architecture, you know, the, yes. the houses, the apartments. Uh -huh. Yeah, so how, how does that? Well, I mean, I think it was also uh, just a function of the, you know, competition culture. Um, most of those competitions were for large buildings. So it was somewhat absurd, I think, that you know the whole generation went after, you know, had the hope and also the interest in you know making big claims, big statements right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, FOA got it. You know, they, yes, they did it. And I think the other thing was that. Rightly or wrongly, we were encouraged because there was the dialogue, and everything that we all did got published and talked about. So the importance of the small magazines. Stan yes. was uh, coincidentally the project's um, uh, editor um, for you know that MIT Press right pu pu publication. What is it? I'm losing my mind. No. Assemblage. Assemblage. Yeah. Assemblage. Assemblage. So I think, you know, you were sort of egged on, even in a, in a foolish way. It's not a practical or realistic thing to do in a way, but I think it did advance us academically as the Assemblage magazine advanced all the theoreticians. You know, the, of course, it also vanished as soon as they got tenure. Yes. But, you know, I mean, I think that was part of it, too, was the excitement of doing that, you know, not only doing the designing, but also discussing the work, and, you know, it was an end in itself, in a sense. And I think the discussing of the work, you know, I, I, like, one of the images that come to mind is um, Sylvia Lavin um, arguing for, um, for these, uh, these things happening, and... and, mm -hmm. and and arguing a uh, few years later against the professionalization of the profession in a way, how yes. everything became instrumental, everything became useful, right. and the kind of excess of experimentation right. uh, kind of uh, right. disappear. I mean, it's also in the technologies. I mean, I think Jeff Kipnis very rightly pointed out that you know, BIM and all of those technologies are not to make expensive buildings cheaper, but f to make uh, cheap buildings even cheaper. <laughs> yes. you no, know, it's not what, yeah. Well, I, I should thing. point out that oh, actually we didn't start up with a big uh, proposal like we, we have been doing, that which I love so much. The yes. bigger scale is my thing. But we start up with a uh, Furniture scale and the landscape yes. proposal, and we built lots of that. But always mm -hmm. because of landscape, including this garden object, but also some architectural element, always had uh, some infrastructural uh, aspect in that. And then we really, when we start doing competitions, in COP, we incorporated. Uh, uh, infrastructure system into the building. Mm -hmm. So that, that's uh, made us too easy to develop bigger project. Yeah, yeah with yes. Stan, actually. We did the Venice Gateway competition with him, which was a real breakthrough. Mm -hmm. We did right. an enormous research project on the water supply. Yes, I remember we that We mapped too. Yes. and went nowhere. And then we decided to try a competition, and it clicked. Mm -hmm. it wasn't, it was a, I, also, it wasn't self-generated. There was a deadline. We didn't have to invent the program. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, uh, it, w it was an enormously liberating coming out of Cooper Union, where it was mainly, and Cranbrook, which was mainly about a hermetic, you know, self-generated project. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, even those small projects, 
were influenced by the economy. I mean, basically, we avoided teaching for five years like the plague. And then the economy tanked in 1991, so I had to go teach. Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't have those small projects anymore. Mm -hmm. Didn't show them today, but yeah, I mean, that was, uh, it was the same year, you know, Tom Maine went bankrupt the first time. I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, some people have been preparing for, for that happening again. I remember at, at one point of the lecture you mentioned the uh, mode of sustainability becoming an objective uh, way to kind of quantify or, I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe qualify um, architecture. Uh, on an objective level, and I wonder as certain other um, like parametric models for like flow analysis and um, measuring how efficiently the air is mm -hmm. moving, all of these other things become more available. Do you think that takes away uh, too much uh, agency from the architect to um, explore new ideas, or no, is I mean, it I, it was already, course? in a sense, I mean, all of the structural analysis programs were essential in developing uh, the 014 building, um, because, you know, we were given kind of rough parameters for how much the scale and the drift for all of the holes, but then we were constantly sending them back uh, to the structural engineer who would run the programs and then, you know, tell us, well, you've got to move this there and this there, and then it was a constant, you know, kind of back and forth between that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of work. Um, but I think, you know, I guess asserting kind of authorial control over it, I mean, the decision making, there was a lot of, uh, you know, a latitude in a redundant project like that. So it could have taken many different, you know, configurations. But I think, I think we're still probably, you know, heavy duty authors, I have to say. We're not, you know, trying to, offend. but I think, I mean, you know, there's also a lot in those um, programs in a sense, and in that, those routines which are in a sense impersonal. So it's about some kind of give and take between you know architectural will and what the building uh, can stand doing. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think what, what the argument that you're making in the lecture is that that is or will become the minimum requirement of, right. of an architect in the same way. It's the law. It's the law, and it, it's like <laughs> so <laughs> that to anchor your work solely on that. Um, it's it's like anchoring your work on uh, fire egress, and and, uh, and so that um, the discussion needs to include that, and at the same time move beyond. It. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I was actually relieved when I saw you know Bob Stern's project and Tom's that so many different types of architecture are possible, and you know, that can meet the constraints. There wouldn't be a sustainable architect. You know, sustainable buildings, yes, but not, mm -hmm. fortunately, not sustainable architecture. Mm -hmm. I was curious, it, it, in talking about winning the um, pop music competition through the articulation of the project as a set of discrete objects, it seems like, or maybe it's just a general comment, it seems like mm -hmm. the, your practice is interesting in the way that it seems to hold intention. On the one hand, the kind of flow and what we mm -hmm. understand from that uh, 90s architecture, the idea of the continuous surface and urbanism as flow, and on the other hand, maybe more the Rossi idea of the mm -hmm. field of discrete objects in the city. And I was curious if you could comment somehow on the relationship between those two urban diagrams in your work. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know, almost that kind of intuitive reaction and realizing at some point that what Yokohama port terminal needed was objects. <laughs> but I mean, I think there's just, yeah, I mean, there are different strands of um, history in, in the office. Um, it's something that in a way you work through. I mean, that, you know, the, there, those are looming shadows over us, Rossi and Hayduck, and, uh, you know, then the work that probably came more out of our contemporaries. But you know, we were practicing already almost 10 years 
mm -hmm. before Columbia. Mm -hmm. You know, we're oldies. We're not yet. We're, Greg was on the low, you know, the young end of the spectrum. Stan's a little older than I am. Yeah. But yeah, so kind of went through a lot. So the influence, Stan is probably more explicitly Latin, I mean, the influence of, of Moneo and yes. it's more clear. But there are these funny contradictions that have to get worked out in the, in the work. And they're not, you know, immediately obvious and they did pose a lot of, you know, angst and uh, created. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and the discussion of flow versus the object uh, was very much present in, in those final reviews. You know, it's a, it was a, a very heated context. Uh, and and I, I remember people remarking that all our projects were cow stomachs with like, you know, <laughs> uh, like that. And, and, and so like also the way Form C kind of uh, influence, you know, the two oh, sure. influencing um, the, the, the way things look. Oh yeah, a constant battle for us. Yeah. I mean, either there was a lot of dazzle and excitement at the time about those programs, but we were actually, you know, in some kind of, I don't know, a lot of tension, you know, because there's a certain inertia in those programs is just going to produce mm -hmm. smoothness, whether mm -hmm. you like it or not. Yeah. Um, I, yes. And, 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 you know, uh, you're very, uh, <laughs> both of your, ins because I think you both have this tendency of kind of creating a smooth form and then giving it a knife mm -hmm. edge, you know, a very precise <laughs> joint. Right. Uh, yeah. And so that um, vocabulary, insisting on that vocab vocabulary, goes many way against the tool because the tool wants, right. you to know, fill it one everywhere. thing. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is that the, this is a very insider comment. So yes. Oh, the wax? Models. Yeah, the wax is like, you're able to form it the way that the form Z would behave. Right. Oh, right. Right. Like physical material. So it was always trying to approximate the analog model. Right. And then being disappointed or trying to do workarounds and... But also, we didn't have a computer. Well, for years. Right, for many years. <laughs> well, the wax was the computer for years. Yeah. And was, it, and, and we for were many, the last people to have a computer. And then for <laughs> many years you had the computer to design, but not to build. And so it's like integrating <laughs> all these techniques from right. many, dis many, dis many different disciplines yeah. require this level of obsession of knowing that you want you know, this or that. And right. it's evident in the work that you're about to open. No, it was absurd too, because honestly we were not and aren't experts in computation. So, you know, it was like you know, throwing yellow trace over a computer screen and sketching <laughs> it, or hacking up a 3D printed model to get what we wanted. I don't know, so, you know, we belong to this very, you know, particular generation, <laughs> I guess. So the book, I've, I've mentioned this to you, there's an autobiographical quality to the book, which, and you described it with Citizen Kane tonight, which makes it more clear to me how you did that. Uh, Steve Hall, who's home with the flu, wanted to be here. He had the same reaction when the book came out. He was trying to figure out the autobiographical quality. <laughs> and he just blurted that out to me, and I said, no, I noticed as well, including pictures of having dinner with Quinter and Kipnis, yeah. et cetera, which I brought up. But the reason I bring it all up is that I think, Galia, your comment about the, the curve and then the cut, and your description of you know, hacking up a 3D model and not having the computer, et cetera, so the autobiography makes sense to get to the root of those kind of things, how they happened, you know, mm -hmm. and that they happen in context. But I have a, I'm thinking of a kind of bigger autobiography. The, the, the Team 10 put out a, well, there's an archive of Team 10 letters from 10 years ago. You probably have it, the big orange, yellowy book. Don't have it. But. <laughs> yeah, there's a description in there of building Toulouse 20,000 for 20,000 people halfway through and the students are objecting that Ken Dillis has become a lackey for capitalism. Uh -huh. The project's too big, how could you work for the state? By the time it's done, it will be obsolete. You know, we can't work at this scale anymore. And it describes this intimate kind of crisis that's going on autobiographically, which I never heard in anywhere mm. near that clarity, clarity until I saw the archive. So I think of like, a, your generation, a lot of people's recent generation, by that I mean the last, like since the 70s, and of course you're much younger than that, but the, 
a scenario of recoiling from these large state-based projects, which had huge amounts of form attached to them. Mm -hmm. uh, like Ken Dillis, Joe Sikkim Woods, the 120 degree angle was appropriate, 130 mm -hmm. wasn't. Um, so it seems to me like there's a battle between the discipline and the practice, but through some sort of relatively large project that gets cut into a kind of still life. Mm -hmm. Like this will sound bizarre, but the one project with the raw steel, it looked like you built it out of steel anacondas. Those columns are big, like mm -hmm. fat round things. In other words, there's this kind of monstrosity quality mm -hmm. you're after. Mm -hmm. And you're, is the form the form of the building? Is the form the form of the column? Is the form this? I think the things are like super capitalized, thereby they are of the profession. Mm -hmm. They're of all the money. You know, Alejandro early on wrote about flexible accumulation of capital, trying mm -hmm. to indict Ram and Stephen and everybody else for surfing that economy and not admitting it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you're in that economy that a lot of people are trying to deal with today by being less disciplinary, mm -hmm. but you're trying to find this kind of monstrous form still. I don't know, at monstrous, you know the term, you of course know this term, both of you know the term monstrous mm -hmm. in its history. But in other words, I wonder, the, the question I was gonna ask you is simple is, like Robert Kappa got a Leica camera and could chase the war. Right. Picasso stayed home in the studio and made Guernica. He stayed a painter and kept the discipline of painting alive, mm -hmm. but could object to the war or speak to it. Right. Guernica got the camera and used it and ran and got in the battle. I'm not Guernica, Cap Kappa. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like you're probably more like Kappa, <laughs> both of you, <laughs> than Picasso, but I think mm -hmm. you're giving a lecture that's sounding like you want to be Picasso. Uh, <laughs> in other words, I think you have a million new tools in there mm -hmm. that are not form or that form is not the right term anymore. Maybe. Or yeah. form would start an unnecessary war with Could the be. current kind of economic Yeah, I think it's probably yeah. just, uh, yeah. I like it, but. It was my it, reaction to, you know, the kind of obligatory um, introductions I've been hearing, which have to denounce form before the lecture is presented. I mean, what instigated so, I mean, me was Gallia's very precise than reading. That and it's, you know. The, but that very precise reading of the spline and then the cut. And your question in that regard about was that a kind of internal, to me that's, that's a quality of form that's really hard to get to describe and to make able to be public. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is? Form is like sex, it's better than than is spoken about. <laughs> <laughs> Also, and Nanako, in her own way, I mean, I was brought up by a formalist. You know, my mother is an arch formalist. Yeah, so I would get, you know. Your great teacher talked, what's that what? one poem, The Undertone, Heda? Mm -hmm. Like the quality that is evident from form but not apprehendable, that whole poem, I think, was mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. at that, right? So I'm just curious about. I guess you guys kind of mentioned it, just like the notion of intuition and how do you judge sort of what's right. You sort of had a long career with lots of different tools and sort of lots of things to judge yourself mm -hmm. and the work against. And I'm just wondering if that's something you think about, do you trust yourself more? Do you trust yourself less? Does it something that you consider as you sort of test ideas that you've had for a long time against where you are now and where you sort of want mm -hmm. to go? Oh, um, <laughs> it's uh, it's quite complex because each pro project is you have to include so many different aspects of the architect architecture vocabulary. So the uh, decision making is step by step. It's not uh, something that is come at once because we start with something, but we know that doesn't work. So we have to keep working. Right? right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very difficult to answer that question. But I think, I mean, the other part of it is that you almost have to, I, in a funny way, the intuition is the least personal moment. Actually, ego has nothing to do with it, at least. It's 
almost something that has to be done like, you know, I don't know, it's like a martial art, like that it's in a way trained into you and then the worst thing is to start thinking about others or judgment or, um, I mean, it's sort of almost have to pull back from all of your training and all of the things you have to manufacture to tell the students at a review. And it just, you know, then you can actually make a reasonable judgment. But if I have Jeff Kipnis come in and start giving me, you know, complex arguments and reasons, I get completely confused. So I have to go back to being pretty <laughs> neutral. <laughs> I don't know. And just responding, getting a fresh eye on something. I don't know if that helps. Uh, Answer yeah. the question. It's almost, you know, like looking at something too long, you lose it. Yeah, it makes perfect sense that you would need to be ready for the intuition, but you cannot, yeah. um, you cannot arrive to it any other way than right. by being ready before it. You know, right. you cannot manufacture no. an intuitive response. It's either there or it's not there. Have you, have you prepared yourself right. to it or not? Have I fooled myself for like five days? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it, this is, this is bad. <laughs> but also, it. we but went through the certain period when we were young. We had a lot of influence of uh, John Haddock and other professors in Cooper, but also Jesse had uh, experience of working for Aldo Rossi. So every time we do the project, um, you know, we keep working and then suddenly we realize, oh, this looks like a John Haydock's work. This is no good. We had to just <laughs> trash that thing and start again. And then it keep going like that all the time. Because we are told by John Haydock that we, you can't copy anybody's work, but also at the same time we had to keep developing it. I mean, Haydock was really interesting. This was, there, I had a scene with him once where I was kind of, he, he shoved a sketch at me and I had to draw up. And so almost passive aggressively, I, I drew it up exactly like the sketch. And he looked at me like, you know, you know what's going on here and I know what's going on here. Get the fucking proportions right. <laughs> and I did it. But it, yeah, so he, I mean, he had that, he had a much better ability than us, but you know, I think that's part of it too. It isn't even literally what's drawn, but he knows, you know, what's expected. But it's part of the training too. Yeah. I mean, it was just, uh, yeah. I don't know if that's even taught now. Well, I Nobody think a lot of that intimacy of professor, student, it's now, it's now not possible. It's now it's now yeah. not um, permitted in a way. It's like right. it's too intimate. Of you know, it, right. it's like it, it, for a teacher to say so directly right. what you are doing. It's not what you're supposed to do. Get it right. Right. Well, it this was, was for him, of course. It yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah, as yeah, yeah, a student yeah. project, but it was for him. So yes, 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 gonna, yes. Uh, I see. He wasn't going to mess around. You know, in his discussion. office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see. I see. Nana Koche, see, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us.